Good afternoon. The National Assembly for Wales is now in session. And before we begin this afternoon's uh, business, uh, it gives me great pleasure to announce that in accordance with Standing Order 26.75, the Agricultural Sector Wales Bill was given royal assent on the 30th Yay. of July. Wow, I don't get that response very often. Um, we now move to the, um, the order paper. And the first item this afternoon is questions to the First Minister. And question one is Keith Davis. Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister had with the UK Government regarding the State of the Union ahead of Thursday's referendum. Many, many, many discussions over the past few years have called repeatedly for reform of the UK's constitution to take account of devolution. That position, I'm glad to say, has gained increasing support. Well, in a world of growing uncertainty, it is important to know who your friends are. Being part of the UK and in turn part of Europe provides that. Both the Tories and Plaid Cymru would like to see those partnerships broken. Does the First Minister agree with me that the effect on our small nation and our economy would be devastating? Yes, as a patriotic Welshman, I want to see what's best for my nation. I believe that my nation's future is best served by being a nation with a strong identity within the Union, or a reformed Union, of the UK and indeed of the EU. Susie Davis. First Minister, um, whatever the outcome of Thursday's vote, uh, the UK Government has said that the, uh, the uh, devolution settlement in the UK will need rebalancing. Um, are you able to tell us of any specific arguments that you've put forward in any of those many, many meetings about Barnet reform? Yes, Constitutional Convention, uh, Wales is underfunding to be dealt with, implementation of Part 1 of Silk in its entirety, implementation of Part 2 in its entirety. Uh, a constitutional convention to deal with issues regarding the whole of the UK. These are issues the UK government, I'm afraid, took no notice of two years ago, and now they are taking a great deal of notice of. I believe that whatever happens on Friday, whatever the result, it will be absolutely essential to ensure that we have a UK that is fit for the future. I heard very carefully, I listened very carefully to what the Prime Minister himself said when he said the United Kingdom is not a nation. It is made up of four nations, and that must be reflected in any settlement from Friday onwards. Simon Thomas. Uh, uh, First Minister, can I take you back uh -huh. to the uh, 19th of November 2012, when you said, uh, we know Wales is underfunded by £350 million a year. If we accepted income tax variant powers, it would simply lock in permanently the underfunding. Now, that can't possibly be in Wales' best interests. Now, today, your leader said that the Barnet allocation would be locked in permanently and in perpetuity, and the underfunding for Wales will continue. By your own definition, that is not in Wales' best interests. Can you tell the Assembly why you and your party have failed to act in Wales' best interests or the debate of our Constitution? Well, I would remind the member that Ed Miliband has made it clear, and uh, this is something I agreed with him, that Wales' is underfunding will be addressed with the election of a Labour government. He's made that quite clear, ban it or not. That is something that will be delivered by a Labour government elected in May, something that Plaid Cymru can never deliver. Mick Antony. First Minister, Plaid Cymru argue that the Scottish referendum opens the door to the prospect of independence for Wales. There is no evidence to suggest that the people of Wales would choose independence, let alone have it imposed upon them. Would the First Minister agree with me that the door that will be opened is one that offers further devolution across the whole of the UK so that the aspirations of different regions of the UK can be realised, including those of us here in Wales? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, what, what, is, what was curious yesterday, uh, Chloe, was that I found myself agreeing with David Cameron, Nigel Farage and John Redwood. In the sense that David Cameron said that the UK is made up of four nations, John Redwood called for more devolution, and Nigel Farage called for a federal UK, which, was, uh, which shows how far we have come in terms of the UK's constitutional journey. One thing is absolutely clear, and that is that the old union will not work from Friday onwards. There is a need to reconstruct the union on a path of equality, on a path of the equitable distribution of resources, as was pledged by the three UK party leaders yesterday. And that is something I look forward to discussing with colleagues in England, in Northern Ireland and in Scotland. Uh, question two, William Powell. Jochen Wald, Will the First Minister please make a statement on apprenticeships in Mid and West Wales? 
Yes, funding across Wales is being directed towards apprenticeships for those aged 16 to 24, as well as to higher level apprenticeships, ensuring that young people in Wales continue to receive the skills they need to progress in their chosen career and indeed to progress to further learning at a higher level. I'd like to thank the First Minister very much for that response. Uh, some contacts that I've had with business leaders and members of the British Institute of Hospitality over the summer has flagged up particular concerns around access <coughs> to apprenticeship funding for the over 25s and particularly those returning to work maybe after maternity uh, or other career breaks. Uh, what steps, First Minister, are you prepared to consider to address this particular issue, which is of great concern, especially in the rural areas where recruitment is a problem and where the economy is potentially more fragile? Well, we will do what we can, but given the financial situation that we face, we've had to target our resources in the most effective way. Uh, and that uh, will mean that higher level apprenticeships will stay, whilst language apprenticeships will uh, remain. And also, of course, we'll continue to build on the highly successful Jobs Growth Wales scheme. Russell George. Uh, First Minister, your government has made much uh, fanfare of the uh, schemes, particularly the Young Recruits Programme. One of my constituents has been an active participant in these schemes, providing uh, valuable expertise to a number of apprentices. And I wanted to take, uh, I wanted to take on three uh, electrical uh, apprentices this September, uh, but they've been left in limbo because he doesn't know whether there's going to be any support for him to take these three young men on. Uh, why has he been put in this uh, position and what advice can you give him uh, that, uh, that funding will be secured and that he won't have to let down these three men? Uh, well, uh, I advise him to uh, contact either my office or the Minister's office with his details, or indeed you as his uh, member, in order that we can examine what might be possible. But uh, the reality is we cannot keep spending where we would want it in terms of apprenticeships because of the budget settlement we've received from London. Ellen Jones. First Minister, your government has cut a number of training and education budgets during this financial year and over the summer recess. And the implications of cutting back on the apprenticeship budgets is that in West and in West Wales there won't be any apprentices taken on by businesses between now and next April. Considering the level of unemployment amongst young people, do you believe it's acceptable that your government has taken this step? Well, I don't accept that that's correct, bearing in mind that we do have Jobs Growth Wales, we do have apprenticeship schemes that are still in place, and I therefore don't accept that there will be nothing available at all. It is true to say that some of the schemes are still in place, particularly those targeting young people. We now move to questions from the party leaders, and first this afternoon, the Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Archie Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, first Minister, yesterday the Deputy Leader of Plaid Cymru said that uh, you had betrayed the, nas the Welsh national interest in your discussions and your debates uh, about Wales's place within the Union. Do you not agree with me? The only betrayal that anyone will have is seeking to break up the Union of the United Kingdom that has created so much economic vibrancy, social cohesion and, above all, offers such a bright future for the peoples of these islands. Uh, I think uh, you're both wrong. <laughs> I don't like the word betrayal. I think this is a, uh, an exercise in democracy. There are different viewpoints around this chamber and those viewpoints should be respected even though we may not agree with yours or indeed Plaid Cymru. I find that quite remarkable as you disagree with the position I put to you, but there again, that's your view. Um, what we've also hosted through the summer recess, First Minister, is the NATO summit that showed Wales off in its true colours, able to host such a magnificent display of solidarity in the face of many trials and tribulations across the world. And Barack Obama, on leaving uh, Wales, said, you can see the natural beauty, the wonderful people, and great hospitality when you come to Wales. Is it not a fact that if we were not part of the United Kingdom, Wales could not play its role in supporting the ambitions that all the leaders stood for when they came to Wales at the Celtic Manor and Cardiff Castle and the declarations that NATO made about securing peace across the areas that it has responsibility for? Well, there's no question that, that uh, we could not have hosted the NATO conference, there's no question about that, uh, if we were not part of the UK, nor would we have received the same level of, uh, of publicity that much is true. I was very pleased uh, with the publicity that was generated. I look forward to the investment conference that will take place in November. Uh, and of course, uh, we had the, uh, the receptions, one for the media and indeed the reception that was held uh, in the Celtic Manor. And I was glad to be joined there with the leaders of Plaid Cymru and the Liberal Democrats. 
First Minister, I do find it somewhat surprising that on the first question you were unable to stand in agreement with my good self, but I also note that the point that you made to Mick Antony, that you were going to have discussions with other people across, or colleagues as you put it, in England, Northern Ireland and Wales, but you didn't, uh, in Northern Ireland or Scotland, but you didn't say Wales. Would you entertain having that discussion with the political leaders here in Wales over the way that the union is shaped in the future? Because it is vitally important that where we disagree, we can have that debate. But we can offer common ground in the discussions that after a no vote on Thursday, we can go and actually develop a union that will be responsive to the needs of the 21st century and find common ground in the principles that will benefit all the peoples of the islands of Great Britain. Well, I, I, and indeed Northern Ireland. Uh, I, I've been saying this for two years, so I agree with him. Uh, I think it, was, it should have been done a long time ago, that there should have been a convention process to ensure that the UK faced the 21st century with a more modern structure than it has now. I think what has happened in the past few weeks is quite remarkable. Uh, the fact that there is acknowledgement uh, in Westminster of the family of nations, Prime Minister's words and others, of the four nations of uh, the UK, of the need to look very carefully about the structure of the UK. I mean, these things can't be done overnight. Uh, there will be differing viewpoints, but it does need to be done. And Wales must for part, form part of those discussions. In the same way, uh, we would not, as a government, accept Wales continuing to be underfunded. And uh, if Barnet is to remain, as per the pledge that was put forward yesterday, it's important that what we as a party have put forward, namely Barnet Plus, that Wales' funding is dealt with, uh, is taken forward. That is a view shared by the Liberal Democrats. I know that. Uh, I don't invite the leader of the Conservatives to say this now, but uh, I invite him in due course to outline his position in terms of what uh, Wales' funding position should be in the future. So you're not going to have a dialogue? We now move to Leader Applied Cymru, Leanne Wood. Yeah. The First Minister is right. It is remarkable what the establishment can come up with when they're faced with the panic that they've been faced with over the last few weeks. This morning, a declaration was made jointly to Scotland by uh, Labour, the Tories and the Liberal Democrats, and among the promises was a commitment to keep the Barnet formula. Already this morning, a Labour parliamentary candidate has condemned this vow in the strongest possible terms. Will the First Minister condemn this vow too? Well, the vow is not to keep a barnet and then nothing for Wales. If that were the case, I could not agree with it. What the so vow says is, is that barnet would remain. But look at the first paragraph, the preceding paragraph, which says that we need to see a, an equitable distribution of resources across the four nations. That means, of course, it will be possible to secure Wales's proper share of funding whilst at the same time keeping the formula. Despite the First Minister's insistence, the vow today commits Labour to the current funding arrangement. And between, between 2010 and 2020, Wales will lose somewhere between £5.3 billion and £8.5 billion to our public services if the Barnet formula is fixed. Now, is the First Minister suggesting today that this announcement isn't the whole truth? And if so, don't the people of Wales deserve to know today what the future holds for their public services? First Minister, in short, where is your piece of paper? Where is your vow? Uh, as Ed Miliband and I have said, a, an incoming Labour government will address the issue of fair funding for Wales. We've said that publicly for some months and that position has not changed. And that fits indeed with the declaration that was made that there will be an equitable distribution of resources across the four nations. That is exactly what we want to see as a party. Labour have had plenty of opportunity oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. over many decades yeah. to reform the Barnet formula and it has failed to do so. Why on earth should people in Wales believe promises now, especially in the light of the guarantee that Labour have made in Scotland? Today was the opportunity for the First Minister to put country ahead of party, to win for Wales. And all he's done throughout this entire period is list the responsibilities that he doesn't want to hold. He has harped on and on about a UK constitutional convention, but doesn't today's announcement show that Team Westminster um, has given us all that we need to know? The constitutional convention has already been held in London and the First Minister wasn't even invited. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure whether the Leader of Plycombe actually heard what I said or indeed listened when I said quite clearly. <laughs> 
quite clearly that we as a party are committed to fair funding for Wales. I couldn't put it more plainly. Nor am I, thank you very much, part of Team Westminster. I am part of Team Wales as somebody who is a proud Welshman. And independence would not make me more Welsh than I am now. And I have to say uh, that the use of the word betrayal by Ply Cymru is dangerous. Is dangerous. Why? Because we know that the concept of independence for Scotland is not supported by two-thirds of the Welsh electorate. We know the concept of independence for Wales is not supported by 80% of voters. We know that the concept of independence for Wales is not supported even by a majority of those who plan to vote for Plaid Cymru at the Assembly elections. You know, that is the reality of the situation for her party. Is she saying that all those people, those in this chamber who are not of the same view of her, uh, as her, are in some way betraying their nation? I think those words are exceptionally unfortunate and I do hope that greater thought will be given as indeed Simon Thomas did earlier on to the choice of words when it comes to describing those who are equally as patriotic as you but do not hold the same view as you on independence which makes up the majority of the people of Wales we now thank you you've had your turn leader of the Welsh Labour Democrats Kirsty Williams First Minister, we have made the biggest strides in furthering devolution when we have spoken with a united voice. Isn't it time for us not only to reject separatism, but to strive for proper home rule for Wales as part of a new United Kingdom? Yes, I do. Home rule is a concept, of course, first put forward, I know, by, uh, by her party, and it's something I think that uh, needs to be res resurrected. Home rule within the concept of the UK is something that I would wholeheartedly uh, support. Uh, and she is right to say that we should reject separatism from the UK as we should reject separatism from the EU. Uh, that's separatism in the same vein to my mind, and I entirely agree with her that it is, Wales is better served in terms of its constitutional future when as many parties as possible can agree on that future. First Minister, as the whole of the UK engages in a conversation about the future, would you not agree with me that it's essential that Wales' voice is heard loud and clear? All four parties in the Assembly participated through the Silk Commission. Do you agree with me now that it's time for the rapid implementation of all the Silk recommendations? Yes, I do. There is no reason now uh, why uh, Silk 2, or indeed parts of Silk 1 that were not accepted by the current government, should not be implemented. We have to understand that <laughs> the atmosphere has changed exceptionally rapidly uh, within the, uh, the UK. Uh, if we are to proceed to a more equitable sharing, not just of resources, but of power within the UK, then certainly part two will need to be implemented. At the beginning of this year, you said that the income tax powers on offer to Wales are pretty much useless because of the lockstep. All four parties in this chamber have voted against the lockstep, and whatever the results on Thursday, the justification for keeping the lockstep becomes less and less tenable. Will you confirm today that if the lockstep is removed, you will welcome the devolution of income tax powers to Wales. Well, if the lockstep is removed, that is a start, but we need to sort out the issue of funding first. Uh, once fair funding is established, then, of course, I think the time will be there to look at, uh, at, at tax powers. Why do I say that? Because it's important. Well, I've said this many, many times in this chamber. We cannot accept the situation where we are underfunded and then take on tax varying powers. In doing that, it locks in the underfunding. If that's addressed, I think this is something we need to look at now. Uh, especially given the fact that there may be a devolution of, of taxes more widely across the whole of the UK, we would need to be absolutely sure that the redistributive element of taxation remains for Wales' best interests, while at the same time there is sufficient flexibility for this chamber in what is rapidly becoming, let's face it, the Parliament of Wales to be able to exercise the powers that the people of Wales would want to see. Question three, Elinid Parrott. Uh, Josh Lewis, will the First Minister make a statement on rail capacity across Wales? Yes, we're committed to continuous <coughs> improvement of our rail services uh, and investment in our transport infrastructure. Of course, for example, we'll spend £177.3 million in revenue support this financial year on rail services in Wales.
Uh, thank you, First Minister. When Deutsche Bahn took over the Arriva uh, company, it paid a fee to take over the Wales and Borders Rail franchise, as I understand, to both the UK and the Welsh governments. Now, the Department for Transport have announced that that £1.2 million that they received has been invested in new rolling stock to increase the capacity of cross-border services between England and Wales. How much did the Welsh government receive from this deal, and what was it spent on? Yeah, it didn't quite work that way, but what we have done, of course, is via revenue spending, uh, improved our rail services. Uh, you look, for example, at, at what has happened with the Vale de Morgan line, and before that, of course, uh, after that, of course, with the Ebu Valley line. If you look at the additional services to Fishguard, for example, to, uh, to Fishguard uh, and Goodlick Station, they have been put in place by Welsh Government. If you look at the uh, partial redoubling of the Wrexham de Saltney Junction line, the redoubling uh, of uh, Gowerton, uh, these are all things that have been done in, uh, in order to uh, improve rail services in Wales. So I believe we have a good record as a government of showing we can deliver on rail. Uh, uh, First Minister, with the railways more often than not, it's the case that if you build it, they will come. Um, for the past three years, the additional services between Fishguard and Carmarthen that you've just mentioned have benefited tourists and residents alike. Uh, may I take this opportunity in the first place to welcome the Government's decision to make those services permanent and as we go forward to the new franchise in 2018, First Minister, will the Government seek to put extra capacity in Mid and West Wales on the negotiating table? Well, I, can, I, I thank the Member for the question. I can say that the uh, Fishguard and Goodick service, or the Fishguard and Goodick station and the services serving the station and beyond the harbour will continue uh, at least until the end of the current franchise in 2018. Additional services on the heart of Wales and Cambrian lines will also begin in May of next year on a three-year trial basis. Of course, much of this depends on what happens with the franchise in terms of whether it's devolved or not. Now, that is something we would want to see with, of course, the appropriate financial settlement. Nick Ramsey. Uh, First Minister, you've just mentioned the, uh, the end of the current um, Arriva franchise in 2018 and the need to um, get uh, the new franchise in order. So can I ask you a broader question um, than Eleanor Parrott did at the start about the future of that franchise? The Enterprise and Business Committee published in December 2013 the future of the Wales and Borders Rail franchise, which set out the need for uh, a very tight timetable to, to make sure that everything is placed for that new franchise to start. Can you tell us where we are on that timetable? Are you confident that everything will be in place by 2018? Because as you'll be well aware, this is a vital part of the North South Wales infrastructure. Mm. Uh, and if we don't get this right, then there is a very real danger uh, that the current service will, uh, will cease in 2018 and certainly cease in its current form. We want it to be better, not worse. I entirely agree. Negotiations are uh, ongoing, of course, because bear in mind this is a joint responsibility. The Secretary of State for Transport also has a role in approving the franchise at the moment. So this is not entirely within the uh, gift of the Welsh Government. It also needs uh, the agreement at the moment of the UK <coughs> Government. Can I say the period of time that the next Wales and Borders franchise will be awarded for is yet to be uh, determined, uh, but I know there is a review that's been commissioned by DFT uh, examining this very issue. But yes, it's clearly important that the service continues at at least the level it has now. And there are many of us who came here in 1999 who will remember there was no North South Rail service in 1999. Uh, it involved a lengthy uh, layover, it's an airline term, but a lengthy stop in, uh, in Shrewsbury. Now we are in a situation where we have uh, regular, uh, at least two hourly services at certain times of the day, and that's an immense improvement from what the situation was like 15 years ago. Greenhub, you're with. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree that the last franchise had been disastrous? because of its failure to insist on any growth in, capaci in capacity on the Welsh Railways. Does he therefore agree that the next franchise must insist on that growth? And the only way that we can ensure that that happens is that responsibility for the next franchise, as well as the funding for it, is devolved. That as part of the whole host of new powers that should come as a result of the Scottish referendum, of course, unless the First Minister wants to be offered that and refuse it. Well, as I said earlier, I said I would be in favour of ensuring that the franchise came to Welsh Government uh, together with the funding, and it's obviously that you've been posing questions without listening to the answers. For Andrew Archie Davis. 
you, presiding officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on the guidance issued to local authorities in relation to the commemoration of those who have died in service of, the, of their country, with particular reference to cenotaphs and war memorials? Well, we owe, of course, an immense debt of gratitude to our armed forces and veterans. We don't, as a Welsh Government, issue guidance. But I can uh, inform the uh, Leader of the Opposition that under the War Memorials Local Authorities Powers Act 1923, the responsibility for war memorials rests with the local authorities. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I've been dealing with a constituent, Sean Woodhead, uh, whose fiance um, died in service of, his co of this country uh, and has got a campaign in Penarth to have his name added to the cenotaph in Penarth. Uh, the local authority, I think acting in good faith, in fairness, to uh, guidance that they thought was in place, uh, have refused that request. Uh, obviously, local government is devolved. Uh, local authorities, as you've given in your earlier answer, are responsible for the maintenance and the guidance and governance of cenotaphs. Uh, in the absence of any updated advice, uh, could I encourage the Welsh Government to enter into discussions with local authorities and the Royal British Legion about providing up-to-date advice so that people like Sean do not go through the uh, trials and tribulations and battles that they've had to have over the last months and years uh, to get recognition of their fiancés uh, passing. Yes, I should say that local authorities have the power to maintain war memorials, not the responsibility, but they do, and, and, and so they should. Uh, I certainly will look at this. Uh, I was aware of it, but I'll, I will look in more detail at the uh, situation that the Leader of the Opposition has outlined, and I will write to him uh, with proposals regarding a way forward. What you doing, Thomas? Uh, pre uh... First Minister, you will be aware that the settlement for local government has been substantially reduced over the past years and that there is a presumption or an assumption that it will further increase in the ensuing years. What are you going to do as a government to ensure that these war, the cenotaphs and war memorials are going to be maintained by local authorities where there is terrific financial pressures upon them and they will of necessity be looking at their statutory duties. A grant scheme has been put in place and that will assist in terms of maintaining the cenotaphs across Wales and those grants will be available up to a maximum £10,000 so we have ensured that funding is available to improve and maintain some of the cenotaphs across Wales and to assist those who want to maintain those cenotaphs in the best way possible. Question five, Sandy Mewies. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. First Minister, will you update us on Welsh Government initiatives to allow young people to enjoy smoke-free in environments? Yes, uh, as the member knows, our Tobacco Control Action Plan includes a number of measures to protect children from passive smoking. On the 11th of September, we launched a consultation on proposals to prohibit smoking in enclosed private vehicles where children under the age of 18 are being carried. Thank you. As you know, I've raised the issue of banning smoking in cars with children present several times in this chamber and very much welcome the news that a consultation has started. Like the British Lung Foundation, which has campaigned long and hard on this issue, um, I'm delighted to see it so high on the Welsh Government agenda. However, First Minister, do you consider that a fine of £50 is sufficient as a deterrent? And can you give assurances that if a ban does go ahead, it will be introduced as soon as practical? practicable as one in ten children are still being exposed to smoke whilst travelling in cars? Uh, I thank the member for the question. Our view is that £50 is the appropriate level of fine. That is um, a level of fine that is the same for smoking in a public vehicle. Uh, and uh, whilst, of course, this is out to consultation, that is the proposed level at the moment. I can say that the proposed regulations will come into force in 2015. Uh, I understand, of course, that members uh, are keen to ensure that this, or most members, I suspect, are keen to ensure that this goes ahead. Karen Miller. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I also welcome the proposed ban on smoking in cars uh, with children. It's something which I think the Welsh Government should have gotten on with uh, some time ago. But of course, it's not the silver bullet to protecting young children from uh, smoke. There are other measures, too, which the Welsh Government needs to uh, take. Can you outline some of those other measures that you're taking as part of your tobacco control strategy? Well, the member, of course, will be familiar with the uh, tobacco control uh, strategy, particularly with regard to, for example, uh, the smoke-free playgrounds campaign that I know Ash has been very closely involved uh, with, and all 22 local authorities have implemented uh, that. 
Uh, we have the Welsh Network of Healthy School Schemes National Quality Award. Uh, that contains a minimum requirement that school grounds must meet, be smoke uh, free, and 69 schools, for example, have already uh, achieved that. Uh, and, of course, uh, within the uh, Public Health White Paper itself, uh, there are proposals, of course, to ban smoking in certain non-enclosed public places, including school grounds and children's playgrounds, building, of course, on the guidance that is already in place. Those are some examples uh, of uh, our proposals for the future. Alan Fred Jones. Thank you. What evidence does the government have of the success of campaigns to persuade young people not to start smoking? Well, I saw, of course, that the numbers of young people who start smoking uh, is falling and it's important that we stop them smoking quicker than we are at the moment. But we hope that we'll be able to have the booking the uh, smoking scheme and that more uh, that it will be reduced further in future. The presiding officer, um, will the First Minister make a statement on the protection of school playing fields? Yes, the use of school playing fields is a matter for individual local authorities. Ministers have no role uh, in, in this. There are no powers for ministers to intervene. But I can say that local authorities have, regard to the, have to have regard to the school premises regulations 1999, and they require that minimum areas of team game playing fields must be provided for schools with pupils aged eight years old and older. Yes, thank you very much indeed for that answer, First Minister. You may be aware that the, the people of Ponte de Lais uh, have risen up against and place, uh, uh, risen up against Swansea Council and placed significant pressure on the council there to ensure that the symbolic plans to sell off sections of the school playing fields across the authority is dropped. Um, given the protections you, you outlined to protect our school playing fields, will you intervene personally to ensure Swansea rethink their plans to sell off part of the playing fields, such as the plans at uh, Pontellis um, Primary School? And I strongly recommend that this isn't ignored, as the strength of feeling amongst the people of Swansea on this issue is indeed strong and has already cost the leader and other members uh, their jobs on the council. Well, I, I am aware of the strength of feeling, uh, and I trust that Swansea Council will consider uh, that strength of feeling when they take their final decision. Uh, as I said earlier, there are no powers for Welsh ministers to intervene. Uh, that would require primary legislation in order for that to happen. That clearly isn't going to happen, as, as, as the member will know, uh, before the final decision is taken. Uh, I understand that the Council has carried out a consultation, that a report is going to be presented to the Swansea Cabinet over the next few months for a decision to be made. Uh, but as I said, uh, we do expect that the regulations should be uh, adhered to uh, when any decision is taken. Mike Hedges. Uh, First Minister, do you agree that the difference between, youth, between playing fields that are used and surplus land around the school? Local authorities need to raise their share of the money for 21st century schools programme. Can I urge anyone who wants to uh, stop the land being sold off to visit Lon Lass and Manselton schools, which are in desperate need of being replaced? And apart from selling land, how else can local authorities raise the money to replace these buildings which are out of date and were probably out of date 50 years ago? Well, I mean, it, it is a difficult balance that local authorities have to achieve, I understand that, uh, and there will be discussions around what is surplus land and what is a school playing field, that I also understand. Swansea Council must weigh these uh, matters, I'm sure they will, uh, evenly, whilst considering the regulations before coming to a decision, having of course consulted with the people of Ponte de Lice. Beth and Jenkins. Uh, First Minister in December 2010, on, on 2010, almost four years ago, the private member's bill on playing fields was given royal assent and it hasn't yet been implemented. Now this could have actually prevented the debate that's currently going on in Swansea where playing fields are being sold off or are to be sold off in future. I understand that only this year your government actually consulted on the regulations, but from the correspondence that I have seen with local authorities, there was a discussion on this issue in 2011 in terms of pressing ahead with the consultation. Why has this legislation been so low on your political agenda, bearing in mind that there are authorities such as Swansea who do want to sell off playing fields in our own area? It does, but I well, first of all, of course, you have to decide what is a playing field and what is a land that has no further use. I mean, I don't know the detail at Ponsar de Lais. I don't know enough about the situation there. But having said that, there are regulations in place at present and we would expect the local authorities to follow those regulations before coming to a decision. So it's very important that the council consider that.
Of course, First Minister, the programme under which um, the sell-off of fields in Ponte de Lice um, Primary School are proposed is a sell-off of surplus land. The problem is that in the case of Ponte de Lice, they have included effectively half of the rugby pitch in, in that proposal, which is why residents are opposed to it. I certainly support my cages in terms of finding the capital for schools like Burlice and, and Long Last. Can I ask you, First Minister, in respect to the point that Beth and Jenkins has made, is the government actually proposing to commence that, that measure in any time in the future? Future. And in doing so, will you actually um, clarify the definitions of what is and what isn't a playing field to assist local authorities in making that judgment? Uh, well, these are matters, of course, that, that remain under consideration, but I will write to the member and mm. indeed to the, uh, uh, the, the, member, uh, the Ply Camry member for South Wales West, Bethan. Uh, and uh, I will uh, provide information on what the current uh, situation is and the proposed way forward. Question 7, Jenny Rathbone. Yes, Karen. Uh, what discussions has the First Minister had about the implications for Wales of the proposed Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, known as TTIP? Reserve matter, but uh, given the significance of trade to the Welsh economy, it's essential the right balance is struck between safeguarding and encouraging trade, protecting investors, and, of course, safeguarding the ability to keep services public. Uh, I would not know this government under any circumstances look to support any treaty that would put us in a position of being unable to defend the Welsh NHS. Uh, we are assured by the UK government that that will not be the case, but it's worth repeating the Welsh government's view as well. Well, the um, European Commission President, um, Juncker, has tried to reassure people that he will not sacrifice Europe's safety, health, social and data protection standards on the altar of free trade. Nevertheless, in its present guise, would it not be the case that multinationals could sue elected governments for doing anything that put their profits at risk and that just like the, um, the referendum on Thursday will be a forever decision for the Scottish people, is it not the case that the TTIP could be a forever decision which would make it impossible to defend the NHS from privatisation? It is the view of the UK government that that wouldn't happen. It's for them to express that view and indeed to defend it. What I can say in terms of the, uh, the Welsh government is we would not support any treaty that would force any government anywhere in the UK to privatise services. Public services should be kept public and under no circumstances should there be any pressure on anyone to remove them from the public sphere. William Graham. Officer. As I understand it, First Minister, the EU Trade Commissioner, Carol de Gucht, has specifically confirmed that public services are exempted. The First Minister will know that the European Commission has taken the unprecedented step of setting up a very wide range of panel of business, trade union and consumer interests to take this matter forward. It is hoped that should this come to fruition, it could boost the United Kingdom trade by over £10 billion a year. It is, I welcome the words of the Commission. That is important, but it's also important that the Commission ensures that that message is heard loud and clear by the European Court of Justice, who, of course, may take a different view. Uh, so uh, the more that is emphasised and reiterated by the Commission itself, uh, the easier it will be for governments to keep public services public. Clay Griffith. Then, as part of these negotiations, of course, US senators have called for uh, an end to European specialist product definitions, which, of course, is a mark of quality for us here in relation to Welsh lamb, Welsh beef, Halin Moan, and under the food uh, produce. Now, the EU has already banned uh, hormone treated beef from the US, it's banned uh, chlorine washed chicken from the US, uh, but TTIP means actually that these bans could be lifted. So, do you agree with me that uh, the outcome of these uh, discussions could actually be very detrimental to the food sector? Uh, in Wales, and, and could you be maybe a bit more specific as to how your government is ensuring that those views are being represented within those discussions? Those views are exceptionally important for us. We are ensuring that Wales's views uh, are heard. What I can say is, with regard to food standards, uh, the TTIP is not designed to undermine food standards that exist within the European Union. It will still be the case that anybody who wishes to export to the European Union will have to meet the European Union's food standards, and that is a clarification that I welcome. Question 8, Alan Roberts. You're so with. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on early years support for disadvantaged children under the age of five? Well, we know that this is extremely important. Last summer, uh, early years, 
and Child Care Plan was published under the name Building a Brighter Future and that set out the significant actions that we have taken to date. I acknowledge the significant steps that have been taken, but of course, the UK government in March of this year extended the provision from the point of view of pupil premium to children under the age of five. Your government, before now, have stated that you're not willing to consider doing that, but will you, during your discussions on the budget, ensure that you do look at the benefits for three and four year olds within the education system if that kind of provision is extended? We are more than willing to consider any schemes that will assist children, particularly children under five years of age, and I'm sure this is something that will be discussed over the ensuing months. Jonathan Saunders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, according to the Index of Multi-Deprivation, Tidno Ward in Conway has 20% uh, of children living um, you know, in sort of the highest poverty, the most depressed poverty levels. That's 233 children. Now, whilst we really commend the work of Homestar in Conway, a fantastic uh, support network, it, you know, they're only able to support around 70 families per year. As the First Minister of Wales, what are you doing to actually support those families who are not able to access this much needed support? <coughs> Well, if we look at the support that's available through Communities First, the support that's available through Flying Start, uh, we have a, a good record, I believe, of uh, giving assistance to those communities that need it most with a view to ensuring that they grow and prosper uh, in the future. Uh, and that is uh, why, of course, we have seen so many communities be able to provide opportunities for the people who live there that they otherwise would not have had. Question nine, Jocelyn Davis. An officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on the provision of eye care services in Wales? Yes, our eye health care <coughs> delivery plan commits the Government to improving eye health, building of course on the Wales Eye Care Service Initiative. Uh, thank you for that. A constituent uh, of, in my region experienced a marked deterioration in her sight when her regular eye care treatment uh, was cancelled due to staff shortages at Espeti Cum Ronda and the service was uh, suspended. Now, alternative uh, provision was eventually found, but because of the uh, time taken to do that, the deterioration is for her permanent. Um, would you agree that this is unacceptable? And what action will your government take to ensure that IEK services are improved, or can we expect? more specialist services to shut down due to staff shortages? No, there have been problems at us, but he come on that with um, an unprecedented level of sickness. That is the reason for it. Next question, what has been done about it? Well, the LHB did hold a meeting uh, on the 11th of September to address the uh, problems and to build a more detailed plan for ophthalmology services for come TAF. Uh, patients should see a marked improvement in access to services in the coming sight. months. In the meantime, the Health Board have advised that the hospital has reduced the backlog of patients requiring immediate treatment from 79 to 29 people. They intend to treat the remainder as quickly as possible, and Saturday clinics have been introduced in order for that to happen. If any member of the public uh, is waiting longer than 26 weeks, they should, of course, contact the Chief Executive of the LHB in order to uh, ensure that the LHB uh, moves forward with their case. Mark Isherwood. Uh, next, thank you very much indeed. Uh, next week is Eye Health Week across the UK, as you're probably uh, well aware, with the message that um, people with sight loss are expected to double from the almost 100,000 now across Wales over 25 years, but over 50% of that sight loss can be prevented. Uh, how will the Welsh Government therefore respond to the call by the campaign, by the chair of the uh, Eye Health Week steering group uh, in Wales, uh, to uh, encourage people to have an eye, eye test, eyesight test every two years, not only to establish whether they need glasses or contact lenses, but also uh, to um, detect uh, eye conditions which could cause wider health problems? Well, of course, we have the Eye Health Care Delivery Plan launched in September of last year. We are leading the way uh, when it comes to the Wales Eye Care Service. It is recognised as doing so. It is inevitable that the number of people with eye disease will rise because of the ageing population. But of course, if you look at wet macular uh, degeneration, six years ago there was effectively no treatment. Now there is. People are being treated, and that is something very much to be, uh, to be welcomed. There are some conditions, of course, which 
for which there is no treatment. Uh, it's quite natural, for example, for people as they age, uh, for their retinas to become opaque, and it makes it much more difficult to see contrast. So, for example, as some of us know only too well, you find yourself doing this when trying to look at a document, particularly if it's, if it's got a sheen on it. Uh, but the eye care service is, I believe, leading the way, certainly as far as Britain is concerned. And that is shown by the uh, fact that um, in 2013 and 14, just for uh, wet macular degeneration, there were 30,000 appointments and 16,000 minor procedures to treat people with wet AMD. Those people, uh, only just a few years ago, would have gone blind. Question 10, Mohammed Ashgar. Thank you, Madam Presiding Officer. What action will the Welsh Government take in the rem remainder of 2014-15 Assembly terms to tackle human trafficking in Wales, please? Well, we will, of course, uh, continue our work to tackle this crime, which we prefer to call slavery. <laughs> Our Wales Anti-Slavery Leadership Group is providing strong oversight and clear direction for this work. Thank you, First Minister. Human traffic in Wales is on the increase, with the number of reported cases rising from 34 to 50 in the last year alone. However, as with hate crime, it is likely that human trafficking cases are seriously underreported. What action is the Welsh Government taking to increase awareness and identification of the signs of human trafficking among local authorities, charities and other bodies in Wales? Well, we have an anti-slavery coordinator, of course. Uh, the UK Government is uh, looking at the establishment of an anti-slavery commissioner in the Modern Slavery Bill, which we uh, welcome. Uh, we have the uh, Wales Anti-Slavery Leadership Group and the Wales Anti-Slavery Operational Delivery Group. Uh, we're also developing anti-slavery awareness training to give our frontline professionals and practitioners the skills and confidence to tackle slavery, and there will be an anti-slavery conference that will take place uh, later in this year, beginning of next year, which will build on the success of the conference that was held in March. George Watson. Uh, George Howard. Uh, I was invited to give evidence to the House of Commons at the draft stage of the Modern Slavery Bill. And we in Wales were the first country in the UK to appoint a human trafficking coordinator, and that gives a Welsh perspective. However, since the bill has passed to the committee stage, the only mention of Wales is alongside England, suggesting to me that the bill is more concerned with policing rather than protection, and there's been little consideration, in my opinion, of the devolved aspects of that bill. First Minister, will you raise these observations and concerns with your counterparts in Westminster? Yes, I mean, I, I know that the uh, Minister has been uh, keeping an eye on this uh, bill. Of course, it's, it's England and Wales because th th there are justice and policing elements that are not, at the moment, devolved. And that's why, of course, it's being taken forward on an England and Wales basis, but we are ensuring uh, that the Welsh voice is heard. And it'll be critical, of course, to make sure that account is taken of the, the difference in Welsh institutions. Uh, there is a tendency sometimes, particularly in the Home Office, to assume that what exists in England must <coughs> also be true of Wales. Uh, we strive constantly to remind them that that isn't the case. Thank you, First Minister. We now move to...